We're brought here today by the love that Sarah and Davis share for each other. We're going to be so happy. We'll be so happy. And I'm gonna crush it at being a husband. Happy anniversary, babe. Great idea coming here. It's been an amazing year. It sure has. <laughs> Wait, you do gifts on your anniversary? Why did nobody tell me this? Did he forget my gift? Quick, say something. I also ordered you a gift. It has not gotten here yet. <laughs> I have a feeling I know what it is. I mean, I've been hinting pretty heavily. Absolutely no idea. So, um, there's been something I've been wanting to talk to you about. Uh-oh. She caught me using the decorative soaps again. Have you, uh, thought about us having a baby? Kids, we just got married. Are you serious? Uh, I can't create a human. Yep, he's totally freaking out right now. Uh, crying, mess, noise, poop, lots of poop. Honey. Yes. <laughs> what? Um, I'm ready to think about ha having the Why don't you open your gifts? Okay. <laughs> We made a baby. You're pregnant. <laughs> yeah, I'm so pregnant. Oh, um, like how much? Like a hundred percent. Like all the way pregnant. Ah! <laughs> it's gonna be a boy. He's gonna be awesome. He's gonna play football. It's gonna be a girl. She's gonna be my best friend. I'm gonna teach him how to build stuff. She's gonna do ballet. Throw stuff. Shopping. Break stuff. Theater. Burn stuff. Mommy's little princess. He's gonna be my little buddy. We're having a baby. Oh my gosh. <laughs> yes. <laughs> We're gonna crush parenting. I'm gonna crush it at being a dad. Cheers. <laughs> um, yeah, this is gonna need to be decaf. Is that a... Is that a... <laughs> hey, good morning, everybody. Good morning. It is great to see you this morning. So let me ask you a question. What is it that happily ever after couples know? Well, so far along this journey, we've learned three things they know, and these principles apply to marriage and understand they also apply to all kinds of different relationships that we find ourselves in. It can be relationships at work, relationships at church, uh, in the neighborhood, all kinds of places. So let's talk about these things we've learned so far. We've learned so far that happily ever after couples know that they bring hopes and dreams and desires into the relationship. And if they're not careful, those hopes and dreams and desires can become expectations. And those expectations can, can become weighty and weigh people down and beat people up. But happily ever after couples know, they understand and they realize that they are to give everything they have but expect nothing in return. It's counterintuitive. It doesn't seem right. It doesn't seem natural. But it's God's standard. It's God's word for how we are to love others. In week two, we learned that happily ever after couples know that in their relationships, uh, there, it's really a rush. It's a run to the back of the line. We talked about a principle from God's word called submission competition and what it means to try to outlaw the other, to put the other first, to put the other ahead, regardless of what we desire, we feel, what we want and need. We put others first. Again, counterintuitive. It's a principle from God's word of how we are to love and give to others. And last week, we learned the third thing that happily ever after couples know. This is what they do. They understand that there's going to be gaps in the relationship. There's going to be days when the needs are not met. And in those environments, in those situations, instead of running to them, we want to run to Him. We're going to take our unsatisfied desires to God and ask Him to love us through those situations and those times. So hey, if you're new with us, you missed the message along the way in this series, let me encourage you to either download our app or you can watch from our website. Today, we're going to learn the fourth and final thing just for this series that happily ever after couples know. Happily ever after couples make the choice. They understand and know that they're going to make the happy choice to always, always, always believe the best. They're going to believe the best. Now, this truth is found in one of the letters that the Apostle Paul wrote to the first century Christians in the city of Corinth. And in this environment and in his culture, these were ex-pagans. These were people who were far from God. And so the principles he's teaching, they're going like, duh, dude, we've never heard this before. We don't know what you're saying. And Paul is saying, I know, that's why I'm here. I want you to understand these new principles that I'm teaching. Because they come from a background of not even knowing that there was only one God. I mean, it's just like craziness. They had multiple gods, 
these false gods, these pagan gods. And Paul says, hey, listen, you know, all the gods that you used to worship, they didn't give a rip about people. They didn't care about people. They didn't even have morality. They didn't have anything called values or any of this stuff, no ethics. To make those gods happy, um, you had to sacrifice things to them. That's not the way it is with our one and only God. Our one and only God, and there is only one, He cares about how you treat people. He cares how you love others. This God of ours is different from all of the other gods. The way you measure whether or not you love this God with all of your heart and your soul and your mind is actually how you treat others. It's how you love others. It's the amount of respect that you share and show others. Now, in this popular chapter of 1 Corinthians that we're going to look at today, the Apostle Paul explains this. He unpacks it for his audience, and we're going to walk through it together today. In fact, there is a really good chance that some of you had portions, or maybe all of this read, at your wedding. It's become known as the love chapter, 1 Corinthians 13. Now, as we go through this passage together today, you're going to understand and realize it's probably not that good a wedding literature after all. It's really not for weddings. But we're going to look at it from a standpoint of a principle that will apply to us relationally as we do life together. So 1 Corinthians chapter 13, Paul weighs in. I'm going to walk us through some very familiar words. And then we're going to come back to a phrase that just doesn't make much sense. And we're going to park there for a while and dig through it together and see what God's Word has for us as we learn how to believe the best, how to always trust others. You ready to do some work? Let's do this. 1 Corinthians 13, starting at verse 1. This is a decision we're going to unearth about what happily ever after couples know. If I speak in the tongues of men and of angels and have not love, I am only a resounding gong or a clanging cymbal. So these pagan religions in Paul's culture had these utterances. And Paul comes along and he says, I want you to understand and realize that if you want that to be a part of your religious experience now as a follower of Christ, it's okay, but it's not the most important thing. You've got to keep this in context. You have to understand. The main thing is how you love. You may tap into a language of angels, but what matters most is how you love. If you don't love, you're just a bag of hot air. You're just making a lot of noise. you got to love. If I have the gift of prophecy and can fathom all mysteries and all knowledge, it's like, hey, if I just happen to be the smartest person in the room and I can fathom all these mysteries and I have a faith and can move mountains but have not love, there's that phrase again, this idea of love. I am nothing. So we understand that knowledge is not the essence of maturity. Knowledge is not the indication of someone who really knows Jesus. The revelation, what we want to see, the pure reality is how much they love others. That is the measure of maturity and depth as a Christian, our love for others and our love for Jesus. Then he says, if I give all I possess to the poor and surrender my body to the flames... I mean, if I give everything I own, if I allow my body to go through hardship, but have not love, I gain nothing. I mean, this verse, my friends, is the nail in the coffin for prosperity theology. Maybe you're going like, man, I haven't heard of that before, just in a high-level flyover. That is the belief and understanding that if you give a certain person or a certain ministry money, that you're going to have a certain blessing from God in return, like a hundredfold or a thousandfold you give in order to get. Paul comes and he says, nope, doesn't work that way. He says, listen, if you are giving in order to get, you're not going to get anything. And like if you're giving to God in order to get something from God, it ain't going to work. Now, there are principles and teachings from God's Word that shows and shares what we will be recipients of, but the motivation to get those is not why we give those, okay? So, again, that just blows up prosperity theology. Maybe we'll come back to that another day. But Paul warns here in this passage, talking to these first century ex-pagan Christians, and he comes to them and he says, listen, I'm going to get really practical. I want you to have great clarity, and I want you to understand really clearly 
what this is all about. And what I'm going to teach you is going to show that it's about what you do. It's not about what's in here necessarily. There has to be a demonstration. Yes, it comes from the inside, but this is not purely an inside deal. It's the stuff you do for others. And here he starts into that. He says, listen, love is patient. Love is patient. Um, there are many things in my Christian walk I need to work on, and God is working on me, and this would be at the top of the list. You can talk to the people who know me and do life with me, and they would say, yeah, he ain't got that one yet. Um, maybe some of you would say, I'm with you on that, Pastor Darrell. Um, but Paul says, listen, I want you to know patience is a really, really big deal. Being patient. It's even part of the fruit of the Spirit. We have this idea of being patient, of being short-tempered. Um, such love that, that's patient, it puts up with annoyances. It puts up in situations and environments that just like get under your skin and you're okay with it. It's that kind of love that is patient, short-tempered. Love is kind. It's like love defers to you. It's not about me. It does not envy. Love is not jealous. You know, if you're having a better day than me, if you're more talented than me, it's not jealous in that fashion. If you're the life of the party, that's cool. That's fine. Love does not boast. It does not try to one-up or shut up the other person. It's like, hey, I want you to have your day. I want you to shine. It's not about me. I'm not, I'm, I'm not here to boast. I want you to thrive. It's not self-seeking. Again, that's, their, that's that idea we talked about a couple of weeks ago of, of moving to the back of the line, right? It's not self-seeking. It's not easily angered. It does not have a temper. You may be seated by someone next to you and you're going like, I hope you heard that, right? I mean, it's just like um, I was doing some um, counseling this week and a um, young lady told me that her husband can go from zero to 100 in the drop of a hat. It's like anger can consume him. I mean, if you're filled with the love of Jesus, you're not angry. You know, you work that out. You're not filled with anger. Hey, and here's a big one. Look at this one. Love keeps no record of wrongs. How many of us would love to be in a relationship with somebody who didn't keep score? You know, it goes like this. I remember when you... I remember that time you... Love keeps no record of wrong. Man, who wouldn't want to be in a relationship with that kind of person? It's like, wow, it's amazing. Love does not delight in evil, but rejoices with the truth. And then it's like Paul goes fast, fast paced. He just starts rapid fire. Let me just show you and tell you what love really is. Love always protects. Love always trusts. Love always hopes. Love always perseveres. Now, there's one line in that list that is not completely dependent upon the lover, but on the love E. And it's this one. You ready? Love always trusts. Love always trusts. It always protects even when a person can be wrong. I can always do that, even if somebody's wrong. I can still come back and protect. I can always hope that things will get better. There are going to be bad days. There's going to be tough situations and tough circumstances. But I can always, always come back and think, wow, it will get better one day. But to always trust, to always believe the best, to decide in advance, no matter what you say or what you do, I am going to trust you. That is a keystone habit of happily ever after couples. Always trusts. Now, I want to try to illustrate this for us because I think it's a reality in all of our relationships. So maybe you're here with a spouse. Maybe you're involved in a romantic relationship. Maybe you're engaged. Maybe it's people at work. I don't know how it's going to apply to you. But I want to walk us through how this typically happens because in every relationship that you are in and I am in, there is a gap. There is a gap that exists between what someone has said they're going to do. We have these things called expectations. Honey, I'll be home at 6 for dinner. I'll pick up the kids today. Hey, I'll mail the check for the bills. Hey, I'll go by the dry cleaners. 
We have these expectations that we bring into relationships, at things that should happen. But there's always a gap between what we expect someone to do, what we were told they would do, what they promised they would do. There's always a gap between what we expect and what we experience. There is always a gap. So the question is, what do we do with this gap? And every single one of us puts something in this gap between what we expect and what we experience. Now, for some people, they choose to put in this gap the idea of believing the best. I'm going to believe the best. I don't know why you didn't mail in the check. I don't know why you were late to pick up the kids from the sitter. I have no idea why supper wasn't ready when I got home. But I am going to assume and believe, I'm I'm going to believe the best. I'm going to believe that there is a really good reason. And once we have a time to talk, and once we can sit down and go face to face and have a conversation, it's going to make perfect sense. I just know it is because I am choosing to believe the best. Is that you? Another response that often happens is we assume the worst. We assume the worst. (sighs) I don't know why you did it that way again. Makes no sense whatsoever. I can't believe you can't get this simple task done the way it's supposed to be done, when it's supposed to get done. I just don't understand why. He did it again. She did it again. They always hurt me. Why do I keep going back again and again and again? Happily ever after couples know they have to choose what to place in the gap. They can either assume the worst or believe the best. Now, I'm going to say this about 10 more times in our time together this morning because I want to drill it in. I want us to understand that this is a big, big deal for happily ever after couples. When there is a gap, they must make the wise choice, the healthy choice, the God-honoring choice to believe the best. Believe the best. Every time there's a gap, we have a choice to make. And this is a keystone habit for happily ever after couples. Well, the Apostle Paul said this 2,000 years ago. About a dozen years ago, there's a guy by the name of Marcus Buckingham. He wrote a book. Here's the cover of it, The One Thing You Need to Know. This is not a Christian book per se. It's a business book. It's a leadership book. And in this book, he actually makes a point to prove his point that proves our point. And I want to talk about it for just a few minutes because it's an incredible point that needs to be made for us here this morning if we're going to flourish in our relationships. So what they did is they came and they studied couples for over 20 years. This is a long study. They looked at these couples and they studied them in the U.S., in Canada, and in Europe. And they were looking for a common denominator amongst these happy couples. The researchers assumed that they would be looking for these couples that had gone the distance. And in looking for these couples... They were not looking for couples who were just grunting it out. They were not looking for couples who were just sticking together for the kids. They were not looking at couples who were in a situation where they were miserable, but they could not afford financially to separate. They were looking for and found couples that they searched and surveyed who were happy couples. They were happy couples. They had been together, and they still enjoyed being together. Now, the researchers assumed that over time, this is where it's really interesting, that the couples would downgrade their expectations for one another. They, they thought that they would say, you know what, um, he is not as great as I thought she was, and he is not as great as I thought he was, and so we're just going to lower our standards, we're just going to lower our expectations a little bit so that we can stay married. But they found the, quite the opposite. The researchers they found out that happy couples related to, rated each other more positively than the couple's husband or wife actually rated themselves. It was like, this is like crazy. How did this happen? They they gave their spouse a higher score than their spouse actually gave themselves. They had this unrealistically positive view of marriage, of love. I love one of the summary statements that came out of this study. One of their summary statements was this. Love is actually blind. 
Love is actually blind. Love is blind to the deficiencies in the other person. This is a secular study, right? In the description, they went on to say that the po this positive view they had toward the other person created an upward spiral of love. An upward spiral of love. I've got a slide here that sort of walks you through it. There is this illusion that was created in this relationship that led to this strong conviction, this illusion that you're a great person. I really do love you. They believe this illusion over time. She's the greatest. He's the bomb. They believed it, and it created a conviction. That conviction was so intense, they believed it so passionately, that it led to security. The security welled up with inside of them to the level that it fostered intimacy. Intimacy simply says, I trust all of me to all of you. I'm hiding nothing. I am totally open and vulnerable. And that level of intimacy fostered love. And that love led to an incredibly strong conviction that led to security, that led and fostered more intimacy and more love. And it was an upward spiral of love. Now, it's proving our point, even though, again, it was targeted toward leadership, business. Now, at the end of this study, they made a recommendation. And this is where it is so powerful. Their recommendation was for a relationship to find the most generous explanation for each other's behavior and believe it. I'm going like, I could use that. I could do that at home better. Anybody else with me? If I could just find the most generous explanation when there is a gap and choose to believe it. Again, I don't have all the facts. Honey, I don't, know, know, I don't know why you, and I'm not sure where you were, and I thought you were going. Whenever there's a gap, find a generous explanation and believe it. Believe the best. It's a choice we make. Well, Daryl, it sounds really good. Aren't there some challenges with this? Oh, there's many. I want to mention two. Here are a couple of obstacles that come to mind for me. Here's the first obstacle. It's what we experience. Because you're like me, you're going like, sounds good, but you don't know who I live with. You just don't understand. I've experienced it way too many times. He didn't and she didn't. And understand, in every relationship, there's going to be repeated gaps. And those, my friends, are difficult to deal with. The repeated gaps. Another obstacle. It's who we are. That is another obstacle. So let's just be honest. You and I do not come into relationships empty-handed. There is something called baggage we bring along. For some people, it goes in a backpack. For some, they need a couple of 27-inch rollers. Okay? But every single one of us brings this stuff called baggage. It could be um, a, a father's deal that didn't go well when you were growing up. It could be father wounds. It could be mother wounds. It could be bad boss's wounds that you're just beat up in a job once. It could be the fact that you were in a previous relationship and you're out of it and you're looking back and you're going like, wow, I just cannot believe I stayed with that jerk for so long. And then you find out that you're just like one of three and it hurts even more. And you bring all of this baggage with you and there's a lack of trust, there's a lack of intimacy and it's just like, where did this come from? Well, if you have enough of that that you bring with you, guess what? Over time, you have trust issues. And over time, you cannot build intimacy like that upward spiral of love that we talked about just a moment ago. So, we come into this relationship, and here's what I want us to hear. There are going to be times where you have a gap. And the question you must answer is, how will you fill that gap between what you expect and what you experience? How will you fill the gap. And there's stuff that you bring and there's inconsistencies they bring. Regardless, how are you going to fill the gap? Will you believe the best or will you assume the worst? What are you going to put into your gap? It's a choice that you and I always make. Now, with that background, I want to go back to 1 Corinthians 13. 
going to come back to God's Word, and I want to look at a couple of verses that were there that are important because it really highlights, it fans the flame of this idea of always believing the best, choosing to trust. So let's dive back in there together. Verse 5, love keeps no record of wrongs. I've already spoken to that. The fact, that, you know what, that's an awesome characteristic of love. If I could only be that way and not keep score, not keep records. It's like, oh, wow, yeah. I was working with a couple just a, um, a couple weeks ago. And it was like uh, they had a major fight over just um, one of them being late all the time. And so she had a list of when she was at the gym and when she got home and when she changed the baby and when she was ready to come to the appointment with me and him. He was like, I called her here. I told her we were doing this. I ended up going in the car five minutes before that, and I waited for her. And, you know, they were fighting over timelines. You, you, keeping score, keeping this record is not going to benefit your marriage. And so, again, um, people do this. They keep records. Here's another one. Love does not delight in evil, but rejoices with the truth. Love is not trying to catch the other person doing something wrong. It's not trying to catch them. Love is not trying to build a case against them. And going like, yep, he did it. She said it. It's not trying to build a case. Instead, Paul said, love always protects. Why does love always protect from? From what? From the, de- from the idea that we will not trust. Love protects from, tr- from a lack of trust. That's what love does. It always protects you. We will always trust regardless of what's happening around. We are going to trust. Love always trusts. That's the next verse. It believes all things. It it chooses a generous explanation and then it believes it. Then Paul says, love always hopes. I love that. I love the fact that love trends positive. That love believes the best. It will not go negative. But but Paul is realistic. Look at this. Love always perseveres. And the word perseveres implies that somewhere along the way, there's going to be some resistance. Somewhere along the way, you're going to get fed up with choosing to fill the gap by believing the best because it's happened for the 33rd time. And it's getting old. We'll address that in a moment. But there comes that place in that time where it's like, okay, it's going to persevere. It's going to push through this. We're going to believe the best. We're going to trust. So... Here's the question. In your relationships, based on your personality, based on who you are, based on your past experiences, when there is a gap between what you expect, they promised, they told me, I expected, when there's a gap between what you expect and what you experience, do you believe the best or do you assume the worst? Think about it. In your life, how you're made, the way you live, which is it for you? But Daryl, you don't know her. Daryl, you don't know him. He, she. Listen, you always, 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 always choose to trust. You always believe the best. You know, I'm sure when we're able to sit down and talk, I'm sure when you're able to explain to me, it's going to make perfect sense. Until we have that encounter, I'm going to believe the best. Count on it. I'm going to believe the best in you. Now, maybe you're going like, I just don't know. Well, let me just for fun show you plan B. Maybe you can juggle them and say, ah, maybe I'll go with that one. Here's plan B if you're you're interested. Uh, You can delight in uncovering mistakes, thrive on speculation, assume the worst, and embrace doubt. You want to sign up for that one? No, no, no. Let's instead believe the best. So, homework assignment. Um, For those of you who are coupled, or for those of you who have relationships at work, in the community, at church, wherever... Would you just decide for this week, even if nine times out of ten there is no good reason, would you decide this week to choose to trust? Would you choose to trust? Would you believe the best? Just this week, would you? Would you say, hey, girl, I'll try this for a week. I'll, 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 I'm, I'm going to have some gaps, bro, but I tell you what, I'll choose 
to believe the best. Would you? Would you? Would you choose to trust? Would you believe the best? I think it's important. It's important for you to do. Now, does that mean you're not going to have difficult conversations? Of course not. You're going to have difficult conversations because, as I said, there will be gaps. But what you place in the gap matters. So when there is a gap, will you have a conversation? And after that conversation is over, you're going to get right back to choosing to trust. That's how you're going to do it. You're going to get back and you're going to choose to trust. You're going to believe the best. Just make a choice because that is what happily ever after couples do. Now, obviously, this gets challenging and it gets difficult. I talk to lots of couples. A lot of times my conversations are when they are not in great places. So I'm not naive that this is easy-peasy stuff and not difficult. But let me tell you one thing. If it sounds really good to you, if you're going like, man, Daryl, this, this idea of believing the best and you know, this idea of the last three weeks, the fact that we want to give and expect nothing in return and, wow, this submission competition thing, all this stuff we've talked about, listen, it is not possible without you having a personal relationship with Jesus. This is God's love that's in us that comes out. So if it's sounding like, man, I would love to give this stuff a try, I would like for this to be a part of my world, of my life, of my relationships, understand, it is not possible without Jesus. Maybe this morning a starting place for you is to have a conversation with someone here about what that looks like. What does it mean to trust and follow Jesus? How can Jesus guide me into this depth, this kind of love? Just know after our service, our prayer team will be here. They would love to have that conversation with you. If you can't stay after, put it on your connection card and we'll get in touch because that is the starting place. The second thing I want to say before praying I realize there are different levels of severity when it comes to gaps. Somebody may be here and they just may, man, I'm tired of him always being late. I'm tired of her talking all the time. Whatever your gap is. But there's some of you who are in much more serious, painful places. You're in places where, you know, she shows up habitually drunk or he shows up and he's always abusive to you. There is no way in a 30-minute message that I can talk about isolated instances where you should create a boundary and get out and get help and get relief. What I want to tell you this morning in this group setting, if you're in a place in a situation that is unhealthy, unsafe, and you're like, dear, I, I don't know if I'm enabling this person or I don't know if I'm just creating an environment for this to happen over and over. and I just don't know if this works. Listen. There are situations where we're not saying that you just forgive and forgive and forgive and it's a permission slip for them to do whatever they wish if they're causing you harm. We're not saying that. But if you're in one of those environments, reach out to us. One of our pastors, one of our elders would love to engage in some conversation, help you navigate the pain and the chaos that's currently in your world. So let's pray. Jesus, we love you. We thank you for your word, showing us the pattern for how to love others the way you loved us. We admit it's not always easy to believe the best. It's not always easy to make the choice to trust. But God, when there's a gap, would you help us to fill it with trust? Would you help us to believe the best? Just like Paul, God, it, love always trusts. God, I pray for those who are in difficult places of repeated and even maybe abusive environments. God, help them to reach out, to get the help they need. And most importantly, help us to trust and to follow you in all areas of our life. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Hey, listen, Chris.